Good afternoon. My name is uh, Robert Jones, and I'm the Vice Chair of the World Affairs Council of Sacramento. I'd like to uh, welcome you today to what promises to be a very exciting, entertaining, informative speech or presentation by Philip Yuen. And of course, Philip will be speaking about North Korea and the rather murky and often bellicose regime of Kim Jong-un. Now, Philip Yuen is uh, executive director and COO of the Plowshares Fund. He is a former high-level diplomat working under Secretary of State Madeleine Albright in the Clinton administration. He was also a, a senior advisor to the first US coordinator for North Korean policy, the former Secretary of Defense, William J. Perry. Mr. Yuen has traveled to North Korea, I believe, five times? Four five times yeah. Yep, four or five times. And uh, he actually got to meet the former um, leader, Kim Jong-il. And thankfully, he survived that encounter uh, to be with us today. So Mr. Yuen's uh, presentation will be about 30 to 40 minutes. And we'll have plenty of time for Q&A afterwards. So let's have a big hand for Philip Yuen. Thank you, everyone. Um, good afternoon. I want to thank uh, the World Affairs Council for uh, the opportunity to, to be here with you. I know it's raining outside, so I know it's not, uh, it hasn't been that difficult to get here. And uh, while I can't promise I will be, this will be uh, exciting or entertaining, I can promise you that it'll be a lot more informative. Um, and one of the things I will say uh, from the very beginning, because everyone does seem to ask me about this, is that they always ask about Dennis Rodman. So my presentation is not going to talk about Dennis Rodman, but I'm more than happy to, to answer any questions. So I am pleased, really, to have the opportunity to talk about North Korea. I uh, am the executive director and chief operating officer of the Plowshares Fund. Uh, we're a public foundation, about 30 years old. We've given away close to, I think, $100 million over the last 30 years. And the focus of what we do is to uh, reduce and eliminate uh, the threat of nuclear weapons. So we have been heavily involved in work related to Iran, um, the budget related to nuclear weapons, and North Korea. My job covers a lot of different areas, so it's not often that I actually get to focus specifically on North Korea, and this is why it's such a great opportunity for me to be here to share with you some of my, some of my thoughts about what is going on. Now, my talk, we have had, I think, the last year, a lot of different things that are going on, what have happened with North Korea in particular. We had, in December 2012, the missile test. We had the third uh, nuclear test uh, uh, early in 2013. We had all that ramp up and escalation uh, between and war of wars between North Korea and the United States, where the United States sent B-52 bombers, uh, F-2 uh, um, fighters. Um, and uh, threats of other missile launches all the way through. And then, of course, during uh, the latter part of 2013, we had uh, the uncle, Chang Song Tech, publicly executed, which took everyone by surprise. So it's been a very, very busy year. And I thought the timing of this was actually really, really good because North Korea is not in the news right now. It's been a year since all this has happened, so it's given me an opportunity to kind of think about what has happened. And I wanted to share with you uh, a few of my thoughts. So my talk today is divided into three parts. The first, is, the first part is going to review for people, for those of you who are not familiar with North Korea, why I think North Korea matters, why we should be concerned about it. That's the first part. The second part of my talk has to, is going to answer two questions. And over the past year, I think I've done um, dozens of media, have had dozens of media appearances um, on television, radio, and uh, in, in newspapers. And every single question that people have asked me have boiled down to two questions. And the first question is, why is North Korea doing what it's doing? And the second question is, what is the real threat? So I want to answer those two questions for you as well. So that's the second part of the presentation I'm going to give you. And the third part of the presentation has to do with um, 
basically equipping you to be a much more critical thinker, because that's what we do at the World Affairs Council, is to inform people about what's going on, to have a better understanding. And my prediction is that North Korea is going to, is, well, it's not going to go away. It's a, it's a full employment uh, 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 act in certain ways, but it's not going to go away. And my prediction is probably six, to one year, six months to one year, it's going to be even busier. There's going to be a lot of media stuff that's going to happen. And what I thought I would do is give you five observations that will help you sort of critically examine and parse what is being said and what you hear. So this is sort of my function here, what I want to do today. Those three things. In terms of main takeaways, these are the three things that ultimately I would like you to take away from our conversation today. The first one is that in my belief, it appears from all that we've been able to tell that Kim Jong, with caveats, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, that Kim Jong-un is firmly in charge. That's the first thing. Uh, second, North Korea has no intention, in my view, of giving up its nuclear weapons program. And in fact, its reliance on nuclear weapons is going to become greater. The reason I say that is because there are two fundamental differences between North Korea perhaps in the 1990s when there was a lot of negotiation going on and now. North Korea, the main difference is that now North Korea has a nuclear weapons program and has success successfully detonated and we think is starting to we has weaponized. It's one thing to be working on it. It's another thing to actually have it. And from a negotiating standpoint, think about it, it's much easier to give something away that you don't have and not sure you can get, rather than something that you do have and you have a lot of vested interests that um, want to keep it. And finally, I want to say that more of the same in terms of policy uh, is going to produce more of the same, which is not a lot of movement. And this is, I think, in certain ways, North Korea's ability to uh, play all these powers off of each other in a very skillful way. And unless we figure out how to break this cycle and this dynamic, um, my, my fear is that we're going to see more nuclear tests, we're going to see more missile tests, and, and more provocation. So let's go into the first part, why North Korea matters. Whenever I have a conversation about North Korea and when I make a presentation, I basically show this slide. I, I don't know if you can see it very well. Um, this was back in 2002. There, there was another slide that showed that was really that was released maybe uh, maybe it was like three months old. The same photo. And if, for those of you who can't see very well, this is South Korea. This is Japan. This is China. And this black hole is North Korea. So this is something that I want you to keep in mind as we have this talk. And you know, in certain ways, it's a metaphor for the circumstance uh, that North Korea is in and we as in the United States in terms of what we have to deal with. So why does North Korea matter? Well, the first is we have to worry about its nuclear weapons. Uh, this is the bread and butter of plowshares. We work to uh, eliminate nuclear materials as well as nuclear weapons themselves. Uh, we believe North Korea has 8 to 10 nuclear weapons worth of material. Um, they have a lot of know-how. Uh, we think they're working on building more. Now, if I think it's clear to say, in my opinion, that a nuclear North Korea is a threat to the United States. They're hostile to us. Uh, they have, they've got nuclear weapons, they're trying to make delivery systems to, to, to have the capability to hit the United States, which they don't have, and I'll talk about that in a little bit later. And finally, if you're worried about potential instability, um, you know, this is just not a very good recipe. The second thing that we have to worry about is North Korea has always had the penchant of using nuclear weapons, and it's the threat for blackmail. And so this is something that we're always constantly, and South Korea in particular, faces. And finally, from my perspective, I believe the less nuclear weapons you have, the better. And with nu North Korea, if it becomes much more operational, there's always the danger of an of a Asian arms race. So it's just a matter of time. Um, some people say that South Korea will get nuclear weapons, and then in response, Japan will. 
Uh, China will have to build up its weapons. Um, just not a very good, very good scenario. The second thing that I want people to think about is what I call the loose nukes problem. Now, this is right here, um, nuclear material, plutonium. It's about the size of a softball. Um, this is when it, and so this can be easily smuggled out. Now, to the extent that people are worried about North Korea being unstable or at some point ceasing to exist, which I think is a possibility, I'm not saying it's a strong possibility at this point, but it's certainly a possibility, or to the extent that North Korea gets so desperate or people who have control over this get so desperate for money, this stuff can be easily sold. There are people in this world who would pay a lot of money for a softball size worth of plutonium. Okay, right now we're pretty sure it's secure, but what does secure mean? Against one person, two people, um, a battalion, who knows? So if uh, this, this piece of material has a half-life of 24,000 years, you can't throw it away in the garbage can. Once it's made, you've got to figure out a way to get rid of it or protect it. And this is what we have to worry about. The second th reason that North Korea matters, in my opinion, is its missile capability. Um, we're very familiar with that. We've, we're f very familiar with, uh, with the tests. This is what North Korea sells. It's a big part of um, some of their foreign exchange. Um, and the reality is they are working on a delivery system to hit the United States. Now, they're very far away from actually completing something like this, but this is something that they're working on, and that's why we have to figure out a way to stop it now rather than later. So when you have nuclear weapons and you have missiles, there becomes what we call the proliferation problem. Uh, we don't want them to sell it or give it to transfer it to other people. And this is a really interesting photo um, because if there are a lot of different things going on here. So let me try to explain this. Usually what I do is I put it on one slide after another, but for time I wanted to put it all together. So here is a Syrian reactor um, around 2000, uh, 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 you know, the summer of 2007. So it's before September 2007. Now, this is what it looked like after September 6, 2007. The Israelis bombed it. And why did they bomb it? Because they were convinced, and these are photos, that the Syria had a reactor in this building that looked like this. Something that was producing plutonium, which is a bomb making, if it's refined, can become a nuclear weapon. Now, we know that the Syrians and the North Koreans were talking with each other. And this is an actual photo of the reactor inside. Now, this is what the North Korean reactor looks like. Very similar. So I think the chances are pretty good, um, and I don't have any classified information or anything, but I think the chances are pretty good that there was some collaboration between the Syrians and the North Koreans. Now, if you're worried or you think about, well, was it really a reactor or wasn't? Well, let me tell you, this is what we added. Here is a photo of an ancient uh, fortress. Pretty close in design. So if you have any, uh, and it's very clearly in my mind, um, an exercise in deception. They didn't want this detected. So let's fast forward. What if this became operational? What if they were producing that uh, nuclear material? What's going on in Syria right now? absolute chaos. Can you imagine what would have happened or what we would be situation we would be in if this thing was actually online? That's why we have to be concerned about North Korea and what it does. Next, we all are very familiar. I think there's been a lot of visibility given to the humanitarian crisis in North Korea. Uh, we know they've got 200,000 or so uh, political prisoners in horrible, deplorable conditions. Uh, and they're right now in prison camps, and, and to some extent there's very little we can do. We also know that since the 1980s, uh, since the 1990s, that there has been a constant 
food problem in North Korea. And there are estimates that vary between something like 500,000 to maybe 2 million people died during that period of time because of starvation. So um, as a Korean American, I know that there's going to be an accounting for what happens in North Korea. Maybe not now, maybe not five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years, there will be an accounting. And I'm going to have to look at my children and I'm going to have to tell them, what did I do when all this terrible stuff was happening? And I think as a member of the human race, um, we need to be concerned. Okay. So those are the reasons, and there are a bunch of others that we can talk about that I think North Korea, we have to worry about North Korea. Now let's go to, as I said, the two questions that I posed to you at the very beginning. The two questions that people always ask me, and I feel like, you know, ultimately I need to answer those for you. The first question is, why is North Korea doing what it's doing? Now, uh, my belief is you'll hear a lot of people talking about North Korea. And when you see people talking, they will always give usually one large reason, one reason for why North Korea is doing. Part of this has to do with our, the way our sound bites work in the media and, and television. But I believe that there, are, there actually is more than one or two, there, there's more than one reason. And my thinking about this is that North Korea has very, very limited resources. Um, so when they take an action, they've got to make sure that it counts for a lot of different things at once. Having that as my mindset and looking at what happened during this last 14 months, North Korea, in terms of the missile test, the, the, nuclear, the, the launch of the nuclear test, the missile test, the nuclear test, and the subsequent activity that happened, incredibly well planned. It was very well thought of. For my experience, North Korea's game things out in many different permutations. This is a classic example of they anticipated everyone's move. And the reason why I say that is that the moment the United Nations condemned the missile test in, June, in January of 2013, I think it must have been like 30 minutes before they issued a statement. They knew it was coming, they were ready for it, and then they were ready for the nuclear test and the escalation that went up. So, given that, here are my reasons why I think North Korea is doing. There are three of them. First, there's an internal reason. One is, to the extent that Kim Jong-un was new, and you believe, and some do, that he had to uh, consolidate power, what better way than to put the whole country on war footing? To say that the United States, because of their, these war games that happen, uh, exercises that happen every year, um, that to, to, to create a situation of high tension. The second thing is that Kim Jong-un is only 30 years old. And in a Confucian society, you have to you know, show that you're worthy of this position. And so what better way than to burnish your credentials by basically staring down the United States, creating a false crisis, staring down the United States and saying, hey, I solved it. And what ended up happening was we had all these war exercises that were starting to end in April. In the end, I think it was at the end of April, mid-April, I'm not really sure. Remember all that tension? It just sort of disappeared right after that. And, you know, Kim Jong-un, by either explicit or implicitly, was able to say, hey, I stared down the United States. So internal. Second, there's external. The usual thing that you hear about North Korea is that they're using the ratcheting up of pressure to extract concessions. Yes, they always do that. They need energy. They need food. They need whatever they can get. That's part of the old game. But... There is an interesting dynamic here that people didn't necessarily think about. What I'm th saying is that this was this whole last year, the first six months or so during uh, the early 2013, was a third test. Not a nuclear test, not a missile test. It was a political test. Now think about it. You had new governments, new governments in Japan, new government in South Korea, new government in China. Uh, new government in Taiwan, and you had a completely new set of national security advisors in the United States. Chuck Hagel, changed, defense changed over, state changed over, national security advisor changed over. These people who surround North Korea, who are trying to work on North Korea, they weren't even sitting in their seats before North Korea started ratcheting up the pressure. Part of it, um, and I'll explain why, was to take advantage of the situation, but two, was to see what are these people going to do? 
North Korea wasn't going to sit back and wait for them to get all organized. They were going to say, how far can we push these people? What are their reactions going to be? And they wanted to see what, they were, what, we, what we were going to do and how we were going to do it. They were going to learn from that. The third reason is, I think there is a military reason. The military reason is essentially this. My own personal view now is that North Korea has a number in mind. And what do I mean by that? In Silicon Valley, there's a joke um, when I was working there um, that said that people who work in Silicon Valley have a number in mind. And that number in mind is there's an amount of money that they want to make where they can basically then say, I can walk away from this and not have to deal with anything anywhere. North Korea has a similar number in mind. I think they have a number in mind in terms of how many nuclear weapons they want and what kind of delivery vehicle. And until that happens, they're going to delay, delay, obfuscate, do whatever they can to eventually get that number. Now, here, so what that means, the implication is that they're going to figure out some way to keep on testing nuclear weapons, the nuclear tests, and to do more missile tests, as well as to figure out a way to do more reprocessing of nuclear material. And for them, this whole ratcheting of a false crisis was a perfect excuse for them to do what they wanted to do. They saw a window of opportunity, and they drove through it. So that's what North Korea is doing. Very rational, very clear-eyed thinking. Second question, what is the real threat? Well, I'll tell you what the real, let me start out this way. The real threat is not a preemptive nuclear strike on the United States. When I was interviewing, I think it was, um, when I was doing all these television interviews, Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, or uh, you know, Asia Television, the first question is, do we in the United States have to worry about what's going to happen? Affirmatively, I will say no. There is no chance that North Korea is going to hit the United States with a, with a nuclear uh, missile, uh, tipped missile. The reason is twofold. One is in order to make good on a threat, you have to have intent and you have to have capability. Intent, North Koreans are not suicidal. They know if they did something like that, they would cease to exist. They understand that. So there's no reason for them to want to do this to start something like that. The second thing is they don't have the capability. Not only, what they have to do is this, and they're many, many years away. One is that they have to take a nuclear device, which is very large right now, and they have to miniaturize it make it a lot smaller. That's a technical, that's not technically easy to do. After that, they have to be able to mount it on a missile. Now, once you have the missile, once you have that done, you have to have a long-range missile that can go up, over, direct it, and come down without burning up. Those are very distinct capabilities that North Korea does not yet have all together. So they just aren't able to do it. So I think people should rest assured that all of this was bluster. So what is the threat? Well, the real threat is miscalculation. And what do I mean by miscalculation? This, if you can read, and I won't read them to you, is all the military assets that are on the peninsula um, during that time of year. Okay. Um, and, North Korea, and when they have annual exercises. So this gives you a sense of what uh, North Korean military assets are. South Korea has 700,000 troops, and the you know, United States, something like 28,000, and then more come in for these war exercises. Now, when you have that many military assets running around, something is bound to happen or can happen. It certainly increases the chances. The second thing is, to the extent that you're worried about Kim Jong-un being a new leader, 30 years old, untested, we don't know how far he's going to pu push the envelope. Kim Jong-il, we had a better sense because there was a track record. With Kim Jong-un, we don't know. And finally, here's the what-if question. So we know that they shot a missile. They were going to test some missiles. During this time when the assets were moving all around and no one was sure where it was, what if a missile, which went off, which went off course, which we know has happened and can happen, by accident hit something. That would not be a very good situation. So there is a chance, again, for miscalculation, for something small to start escalating and moving up and people losing control. So that was what the real threat is. 
people had to be a little bit measured, more careful about what they were doing and how they were doing it. Okay, so let me go to my third part of my presentation. This is going to be relatively quick. Um, and it talks about observations that I want to share with you. As I said, I predict North Korea is going to be in the news in the next 6 to 12 months very heavily. It's always cyclical in a certain way. It's going to happen. You're going to hear a lot of news and information about North Korea. And so what we want to do is equip you to better distinguish and critically analyze what you're hearing. So I put down what I thought were five observations that I thought might be helpful. First observation, and this goes for me too, no one really understands what's going on inside of North Korea in terms of the leadership circle. But, they're not crazy. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, you have a lot of quote-unquote experts talk about the North Korean leadership as if what they say is actually what's going on. But the reality is, is that we do not know. There's so little information about who Kim Jong-un is. Dennis Rodman has spent more time with Kim Jong-un than any American has. Now, Whenever I talk about all these things, I always say, hey, you know, no one really knows, but here's my guess. And it is a guess. You know, maybe a little more educated than other people, but it is a guess. And because there's so little dearth of information, anybody can say anything. And no one can say, you're wrong, because there's nothing to necessarily refute it. And then it becomes this sort of exercise about who's right, who's not, how crazy is Kim Jong-un, or how crazy isn't he? How long is his staying power? Now, we do know a lot about North Korea, certainly a lot more than we did 20 years ago. We know about their negotiating behavior in terms of diplomatic structure. We know about their economy. We know a lot about refugees. We know a lot about those kinds of things. But we don't know specifically about their inner circle. And so from my viewpoint, it's, we do a lot of wheel spinning worrying about Kim Jong-un's staying power. Who is he? What is he? Uh, what is he going to do? There's too much emphasis on that. And so, for me, we have to focus on what is knowable. And what is knowable is that the policies that North Korea has used for the last 20 years is being used right now, with different nuances, but we have to remember that. They use intimidation, they use threats, bluster to try to get what they want, and they have no, um, uh, there is no restraint necessarily on, nece on what they can do in sort of certain circumstances. So we have to remember that. Second observation, high level attention North Korea wants or needs is a lot more than the U.S. can give. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're President Obama and the United States government, these are some of the issues that you have to deal with. Afghanistan, Euro crisis, terrorism, economy, North Korea, immigration, Arab protests, now you've got um, uh, Crimea, Iran. Kim Jong-un, very little. Now, this is not to say that the U.S. government can't walk and chew gum at the same time, because they can. But when I was in government, uh, what I realized about senior level, uh, about the senior level decision makers, the most important commodity they have is their time, and that is finite. So when it's being crowded out by a lot of this stuff, what happens is there's not enough time given to this one, this particular issue. So what does that mean? Well, it means two things. One, North Korea is going to provoke, keep on tapping until it gets the attention it wants. The other implication is that if it doesn't want that attention, it's going to take advantage of that inattention and do something. Before, and then it's, it's done, and there's not much we can do about it. Third observation, and there are two more after this. I believe North Korea has a distinct advantage over other countries in negotiations. Now, why do I say that? Well, let me show you the senior leadership of North Korea. These, um, there's one more photo I should add, but these are the players who have been in place. Now, Kim Jong-un is obviously very new, but 
Kim Jong-il when he was alive. From 1994 to when Kim Jong-il died, um, these were the players, major players, that made decisions. That's a long period of time. Kim Jong-il. And these were the people that I negotiated with when I was in government 15 years ago. Now, all these people are still there, except Kim Jong-il is gone. Now we have Kim Jong-un, and there's another person who's been added. These are the people who deal with North Korea, uh, United States and the larger issues. In comparison, I kind of wrote this down really quickly, so don't hold me to this. The United States over the last 20 years have had four presidents, seven secretary of states, and I think by my count, nine North Korea policy coordinators and senior negotiators dealing with North Korea. That's not to mention all the people that get churned around, um, get switched around when some, one of those positions that I just talked about gets switched. So from the North Korean perspective, they've got a lot of time. A new person comes in, they say, I've got a new idea, but for the North Koreans, it's not a new idea. They've seen it before. Unless you look back and you can say, this is truly a new idea, and it's going to take a lot for, to, for, for the North Koreans to be impressed. And in that way, the implication is they can wait, and they can be patient. Fourth observation, the US consistently underestimates in areas and overestimates North Korea's capabilities and resolve. So in the 1990s, Kim Jong-il, the father, uh, when he came to power, was a playboy, not very smart, was going to f um, and, had, uh, and was, was someone that we were sure was not going to last very long. Well, we were wrong about that. During the 1990s, you mean when we were all there, North Korea was going to collapse. It was simple as that. After that, ah, North Korea is never going to do a nuclear test. There's just no way. China's not going to let them do that. And then on and on and on and on. Well, let me give you the most uh, surprising thing that happened that we completely didn't expect. Aggressiveness and actual attacks. They hadn't done that in a very long time. But in 2010, two particular incidents. One was the sinking of a South Korean naval ship, the Chonan. I think it was like 46 casualties, deaths. South Korean soldiers tragically died because of a torpedo. And then several months later, in November 2013, there was an actual shelling by North Korea of a South Korean island, killing, I believe, two military people and two civilians. I think it was, I know two civilians, I'm not sure about the military people. That was a miscalculation of the North Koreans. They didn't expect, I, my guess, and again, it's a guess, to kill civilians. And this was, that, this was something that took everyone by complete surprise. Now, let's go to more recent history about what I think as the lack of imbalance here, not understanding what is going on, is how the media, and to some degree, some of um, you know, people who should know better and who are better informed. What happens is that it's either the world is falling apart or the thing is a joke. So here in North Korea, North Korea, I remember I was um, you know, uh, kind of a commentator about this missile launch, and we we're doing a second-by-second -second launch thing. And they were expecting this thing to go up. It lasted, I think it was 90 seconds. And North Korea was a laughing stock. They, couldn't sh they were the gang that couldn't shoot straight. And so they were being ridiculed for the things that they couldn't do. And North Korea was suddenly not to be taken seriously. Well, fast forward December. They do that successful launch. They put up a satellite. And the world is falling. And then. What happens is North Korea adds to that by doing a nuclear test, and it just keeps on getting worse. And then finally, it got a little bit better. So this is what I mean about the lack of balance. And the final observation that I have for you is as long as China has North Korea's back, there's little the US can do to apply effective pressure effectively, uh, to apply pressure effectively. Let me tell you what the myth is. There is a myth out there is that China, North Korea is China's problem to solve if it wanted to. 
I do not believe that's the case. We talk with the Chinese, they insist that's not the case. Um, they just simply can't do it by themselves. They are an important piece. So what I would say is North China is a necessary party, but it's not sufficient. And what we have here, in a sense, is that the good cop, bad cop, the good cop being China, which is sort of helping, you know, trying to do nice things for North Korea to get them to do things, and the United States, South Korea, and Japan during this period of time putting a lot of pressure, the good cop, bad cop thing works, but only if it's coordinated. You know, to put a, a gross generalization, what's happening now for all intents and purposes that is that we are trying to block the front door while a lot of stuff is coming through the back door through China. So the reason for that, very quickly, is that there are different priorities. China's priority, highest priority, is to prevent North Korea collapse and the status quo. Until they know what's going on with the United States and this rebalance to Asia, they fought the Korean War to prevent U.S. troops to be on their border. They're not sure about that, so for them, they want to keep North Korea in existence. As it was told to me, uh, the Chinese are going to, uh, uh, what is it? They're not, they're not going to give the North Koreans, let the North Koreans have cake, but they'll let them have rice, a little bit of rice. The United States, our highest priority is the nonproliferation and North Korea becoming a nuclear state. So even though we all agree that we have similar goals, we don't nor want North Korea to be a nuclear weapon state, our priorities are completely different. And that's why we have the different policy. All right, so let me end with this. I think that the biggest challenge for us right now, and this is where all of us can get involved, is to have a better understanding of who we are dealing with. And, um, have a, and basically what uh, we have a tendency to view countries and people through our own biases. We try, we have a, there's a thing that uh, people talk about. There, we want the Koreans, we look at the Koreans, we can't look at the North Koreans as we wish them to be. We have to see them as they are. And how does this affect policy, our way of looking at things and looking through, through a bias? Well, I thought this was a great example. Um, this is Jo Myung-nuk. He is, was, this is in 2000 when um, he came, in, came to North, came to the United States to visit, uh, 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 come to the United States for his first visit. So let, some context. Bill Perry sent, I'm sorry, uh, Bill Clinton sent William Perry, former Secretary of Defense, to North Korea as part of a policy review um, to talk to North Korea about what, how the two countries could get better relations. And Bill Perry was going to make recommendations to, to President Clinton. So Bill Perry was President Clinton's special envoy. That was part of the Perry process. Bill Perry proposed certain things to North Koreans. North Koreans took way too long. They waited almost a year and a half, almost two years before responding positively. So part of the positive response was sending a reciprocal visit, which was Jo Myung Nuk's number, uh, Kim Jong Il's, the father's number two guy, to the United States. Now, Jo Myung Nuk is a really interesting guy. It was said that when Kim Jong Il, the father, was very young, Jo Myung Nuk was essentially his babysitter. He looked after him. There was rumors about him carrying young Kim Jong Il on his back through China to get away from the Japanese during World War II. Very close. And he was number two, um, and he just died maybe in the last five years. So the story is that he came to Washington. He came here to California first, and then he went to Washington. I came here. I was there to meet him. Uh, we, the first day he was in Washington, we met with Madeleine Albright. Um, and part of the focus was him is he asked, when am I going to meet with President Clinton? I want to know when I'm going to meet with President Clinton. That was sort of his focus. He didn't want to talk about anything else. He wanted to know when he was going to meet with the President. We said, oh, it's going to happen. We haven't scheduled it yet. The, you know, the time is changing. And so uh, we finally got it scheduled. We let him know it was going to be happening. And then apparently he said, I have to go back to my hotel. So I said, OK. Uh, so went back to the hotel, and I got a phone call from someone, and he said, and the person said, you won't believe this. I go, what? He changed his clothes. I said, what do you mean? Remember, when we met at the State Department, he was wearing a suit and tie. When he went to visit the president, he changed into full dress uniform with all these medals. And he met the president dressed like this, tons of photos related to this. And the storyline implicitly was crazy North Korea. 
right? Um, hostile North Korea, provocative North Korea, okay? Who's this guy wearing all these medals and he's meeting the President of the United States? You know, the interesting thing though is when I saw that photo, I basically clapped my hands and I said, we're in. And why was my reaction completely different? Well, in my view, this photo, which was plastered everywhere, was not for American press. It was for North Korea. This photo was everywhere in North Korea and variations of it. And what were they doing? Well, even though if you're a total totalitarian state, a dictatorship, just like a large ship, you cannot turn things on a dime. It takes a while. And so if you have been brought up as you have in North Korean society, that the, North Korea, that the United States is the evil, the source of all of your suffering, for you to suddenly change gears is really hard. So what this photo was about, in my view, and again, this was a time when North Korea did not have nuclear weapons, had not tested. They were years away from testing. This was a signal to the North Korean people that times are changing. Cho Myung-nook during this period, I believe, said, the United States and North Korea need not be enemies forever. He says that, and that tells to everyone in North Korea, get ready, things are going to change. So, um, I've gone a little bit longer than I anticipated. I don't, no, not too bad, not too bad. So, why don't I uh, close with this. So, I think what I've done is, I hope, given you a little bit more information, more importantly, about how to critically analyze some of the things that you're going to be seeing, and believe me, next year there's going to be a lot more news.